Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. We are pleased to be joined by uh, people from across the continent uh, for this Global Investigative Journalism uh, Network webinar on investigating com company finances. Uh, this is the first of two uh, webinars on this subject. Uh, we will host the second one on June 23rd. My name is Benon Oluka. I'm uh, the Africa editor of GIJN. I am based in Kampala, uh, Kampala, Uganda, and I will be your moderator today. I will present to you this webinar because, as you know, um, investigative reporting on companies and business, government, corruption, and organized crime is one of the most crucial uh, elements of accountability journalism. And yet, uh, the reality we face at, at the moment is that newsrooms in Africa are shrinking rapidly and experienced journalists who have mastered uh, the, the, the art of uh, reporting on this subject are leaving newsrooms in, in large numbers because of competition uh, from uh, those who need uh, journalists with an understanding of uh, business and finance. Um, and young reporters who take up their place often without much training have few opportunities to, to receive the kind of grounding and mentorship that they need to continue doing robust watchdog journalism. So in a bid to support journalists on the continent to develop their skills in this area, uh, GIJN has partnered with Finance Uncovered to bring you uh, this online course on how to analyze company finances. At this point, um, I'll share a little bit of information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network for those of you not familiar with GIJN. So JJN is the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations. Um, and we work with journalists everywhere in nonprofits, in commercial organizations, and with freelancers. The network was established to connect and support uh, journalists of that nature. Uh, please check out our website, gijn.org, and our resource center, and sign up for our newsletters. We also have a dedicated Africa section uh, where you'll be able to get lots of resources. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter and uh, you, you can also uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at GIJN Africa. Now, uh, a little bit about our trainer today, Nick, Nick Mathiason, uh, who has trained me as well. He's a founder and co-director of Finance Uncovered. Uh, Nick has been a business and financial journalist for close to 30 years and has broken stories with international impact. Uh, Nick's organization, Finance Uncovered, is an investigative journalism training and reporting project. Uh, they are based in London, uh, and he's accompanied by his colleague, uh, Ted Jerry, uh, who, who will be responding to some questions later on, if you have any in the, in the question and answer box. Um, the mission of Finance Uncovered is to improve the quantity and quality of investigative stories that are rooted in illicit finance and exploitation through training and supporting journalists around the world. Since the organization was set up in 2013, it has delivered financial multi-day training to more than 400 journalists and activists, activists from over 90 countries. So as you can see, we are in pretty good company for this webinar. Um, so today's webinar will last two hours with a break in between. And just to let everyone know, we will be recording uh, this webinar. If you have questions, please share them in the Q&A box and Nick and his team will respond to them. Now, without any further ado, uh, Nick Matheson, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Ben, and that's a really kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be, uh, be asked by the GIJN. Uh, we're a proud member of the GIJN, and they've really helped us over the years. And the, the conferences and, and seminars, et cetera, are fantastic, and the resources are amazing. So it's really a privilege to be here. And um, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, just a word about co-director Ted, who is actually a trained accountant. Um, so he will be keeping an eagle eye on where I muck up uh, if I do. Um, okay, well, um, thank you. I'm just going to um, share my screen. Whoops. Okay, so um, financial journalism is seen really as a very dry and arid area of journalism. Um, 
uh, most people will steer clear of the business pages of, of newspapers and won't pay attention to the financial reports on television and radio. Um, and I probably was one of those people, um, particularly uh, um, when I was thinking about becoming a journalist, but I always have remembered something that my uncle said um, to me. Um, and he said that if you ever want to see where the big battles are taking place in this world, read the business pages. Um, um, it took me a few years to understand what he was talking about, but in finance and business journalism, we have to remember that we are talking about people and tension and conflict. The profit motive is something that can create drama. And when, when, when we think about a company losing money, we, we can kind of dramatize that to say that something like profits plunge or profits balloon, cuts that companies make are so swinging. Bosses can often, not always, but often be fat cats. There's all this colorful language that we can bring into finance and business journalism. And the, the kind of big barrier, I think, sometimes is just really not understanding business and finance. Um, and if, if we can begin to understand finance, business, how accounts are structured, what to look for, then actually, you elevate yourself as a reporter and can begin to tell stories that a lot of your competitors or, or, or colleagues can't tell. It puts you in a much better position. And I, I must admit, I mean, I was a, I started off in a, on an insurance magazine and then I worked in a, 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 a real estate magazine. And it took me quite a long time to understand the significance of company finances and reports and, and 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 because I had that ignorance I, I really missed out on a lot of stories and and I kind of felt quite intimidated by financial statements and and you could say that well maybe why don't you pick up a book and 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 and, and, and try and teach yourself and that's kind of what I did um, and, and, and then I took a course by a forensic accountant called Raj Barriolia, who, who also um, uh, was joined by a, a veteran financial reporter in the UK. And, and they really opened my eyes as to, as to how to understand finan financial reports. So, you know, their influence really comes to, to, to this presentation. And, and hopefully, you know, step by step, people who, who are listening and watching to this, you know, the idea is not to feel too intimidated by company finances and reports. Um, so that's what we're going to try and do over the next hour or so. Um, so today we will cover um, some basic business journalism concepts and then we'll look at some basic accounting con concepts, but from a reporter's pers perspective, we are not accountants, um, unlike Ted. Um, and, and Ted will say that, you know, do not expect journalists to uncover fraud and big corruption just through looking through accounts. Um, but what you may see and may learn about is how to detect red flags and, and, and what indicators are important and that will help you uh, um, find better questions to ask your sources uh, and then the, the quality of your conversations and the information will be better. Um, so we'll start by talking conceptually and then we'll get down to the real meat which is unpacking financial statements because once you understand how they're structured and watch what each section can tell you then, then, then you can know what to look for. And, and that will really, really help as you analyze a company. Um, and there are financial statements in accounts, but there are also notes at the back of the accounts. And again, another Ted phrase is, the notes are your friend. They, will, they are made up of words and they will explain some of the numbers. So the notes are really, really important. And we will we'll, we'll work um, in this um, presentation. We, we will focus on about 10 of those notes. Um, there are about 30 in total. So that's how we're gonna uh, run this session.
Um, we may take a break if people are flagging because um, there's quite a lot of information to, to, to take in. I hope that's okay. So let's crack on. First of all, company finances and accounts does have a lot of jargon, but let's not get intimidated by that. Once we familiarize ourselves with certain phrases, then we, we, can, we can kind of cut through that forest. Now, some accounting terms are set by international accounting standards and they're quite rigid. So once you understand what they mean, then you're fine. Some, some accounting line items and financial statement titles, some of those titles can be used quite fluidly. They can be used by more than one name. For instance, the profit and loss statement in a financial accounts can also be called the comprehensive uh, income statement. Um, so there are all sorts of well, uh, descriptions for saying the same thing, um, but you'll get familiar with it the more financial statements that you look at. Um, some of the financial statements language can be a little bit loyally, but you just have to kind of read stuff slowly and hopefully it will filter in. And the solution to all this is just persist and use Google basically for financial statement definitions. That really helps. Right, okay, so let's just go back to basics. Um, I wonder if, um, how many of you in this uh, kind of uh, participation uh, cohort, how many of you have actually run a business? Just say yes, if you've run a business. I'll be quite interested to, to know that. Um, right, so some of you will be freelancers and you won't have a company, you'll just file your, 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 your income and pay your taxes and you're not incorporated, right? Okay, that's the very kind of basic level. Then some of you may own or be directors of limited companies. Now, the great thing about limited companies in many countries is that you are not personally liable if your company goes out of business. That is a great privilege set up by society. Um, it's there to encourage entrepreneurs. Um, so the limited company um, may have shareholders um, in France or in French speaking um, Africa uh, countries, you may have an SARL, which is the same thing. In Germany, it may be called a GmbH, okay? Um, so if your company is doing very well and it wants to um, uh, get more investments, it may um, sell some shares. Um, some uh, companies that sell shares will, will be traded. Um, they will go onto a stock market and stock market companies are really useful for us because they are quite transparent and we can see all of their financial information. Um, I have uh, got some excellent information from stock market listed companies in Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Some big companies uh, in those countries are listed on stock exchanges in those countries. So it can be very useful to, um, uh, to kind of understand and analyze companies um, like that. Um, now, um, a lot of law firms, accountancy practices and architects um, are, are partnerships where you have a few number of equity partners. Um, and they share the profits of the partnership. But if the company, if the partnership rather makes a loss, then they will share in the losses. Sometimes the equity partners may have to sacrifice their wages in order to keep the whole entity running. But if the company or partnership is doing well, they will make potentially lots of money. They will share in the profits. Now, um, a new formation, well, 20 years old, relatively new, um, is something known as a limited liability partnership. Now, these are very important entities. They're used by hedge funds, private equity companies. Um, 
Now, if you don't know what a private equity company is, that's completely understandable. They are an, uh, a fund where investors put money into and the people who, who run the private equity fund buy up businesses and they are traditionally very aggressive companies and they are increasingly buying up bigger and bigger companies around the world. They, 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 they have something like $7 trillion in investment capital to, to buy companies. Um, they tend to own them for between three and seven years and then make an exit um, and they try to target big returns. Um, now, they tend to be structured along a limited liability partnership. Um, they don't pay corporation tax. The partners self-assess for their tax. A lot of them are based in the UK, so we can see quite a lot of financial information. So if a, a, a telephone business in, in, in the DRC or Mozambique uh, is owned by a private equity company that's based in the UK, um, we can see certain amounts of information that can be quite useful. Um, then we have our dear friends, the offshore companies. Now, I'm just going to go to this um, slide here. I'll pop back again. Now, just to get this concept in your, in, your, in your minds, offshore is not a physical geographic phenomenon. Often people think of offshore companies based on Caribbean islands or um, alpine uh, micro states like Liechtenstein or Andorra. Well, a tax haven can be in Belgium or the Netherlands or the UK. Um, not traditionally thought of as an offshore location, but it's basically refers to the practice of recording a transaction in a different country to where the transaction takes place. So a, a, a mine in uh, Uganda could be actually owned by a company based in Mauritius. And so that Mauritius is offshore to Uganda. Um, and when the company is sold, the actual, uh, which owns the mine, um, the actual uh, transaction takes place in Mauritius, not in Uganda. And that's how tax can be avoided. So that's another type of company, okay? So uh, 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 a, a related uh, uh, type of structure is a limited partnership. Um, these are popular in the Netherlands, which is a major tax haven. Um, and basically a limited partnership means a company is actually based nowhere as far as tax is concerned. Um, if you want to read more about that, I would Google Nike and Simon Bowers. Um, Simon Bowers is a journalist who actually now works at Finance Uncovered, but when he was at the ICIJ, he wrote an excellent uh, article about this particular structure, and it's very easy to understand. The final main type of business that you may encounter are a trust or a foundation. Okay, a trust is a legal arrangement when one person, the settler, gives legal ownership to an asset, which is the trust property, to another person, the trustee. Trusts are an excellent way of separating the owner from an asset. And in some jurisdictions, like in Panama, for instance, the actual owner of the property can still be the beneficiary and, control, and can control the asset. Um, they are used by um, charities and can be uh, good, a good thing. Trust can be a good thing. We're funded by some trusts, um, but they can also, in the hands of uh, criminals and the super rich, can be used to avoid taxes and, to, uh, and they, are, they can be a very secret um, entity. Okay, so those are the main kind of um, companies and structures that we tend to encounter. I hope that's useful. Right, so now let's try and understand how a financial, how a profit and loss statement, which is one of the main statements in a company's account works, okay? Now we're gonna be sort of in very simple terms here. So, we together own a company that generates revenue 
of $1 million. Okay, there we have our revenue. Okay, so we are trading mobile phones um, and we have a certain amount of cost of sales to the manufacturer of our phones, um, the components and the people, the laborers who are, who are uh, uh, assembling the mobile phones. And this is costing us $250,000. So we're left with $750,000. Um, we also have separately to cost of sales, operating costs. The executives of our company will be charged through the operating cost line, as will our headquarter office and some marketing budgets. They'll all come out of operating costs. And so that accounts in this instance for another $250,000. We have $550,000 left. We needed a loan to get our company off the ground. We borrowed a million dollars and we're paying interest of 10%. So that, that they are our finance costs. So that leaves us with $400,000. And that is our pre-tax profit. Our corporation tax bill comes out of our pre-tax profit. Not our revenue, but our pre-tax profit. So we are going to be taxed at 25%. So we are being we are uh, uh, paying to the the revenue 100,000 of our 400,000 pre-tax profit, and that leaves us with 300,000 dollars. Uh, 300,000 dollars our profit after tax, and from our profit after tax we will give our shareholders a certain amount of dividends. That's kind of like uh, their major financial annual benefit from being involved in our company. And we may decide to give 150,000 of that uh, profit after tax in dividends, and we will retain the rest of that money, maybe to reinvest into the business or just to keep it as, um, a contingency fund, a retained profit. So we may retain 150,000 of that if we're being relatively prudent. I hope this simple example helps because we'll, it will, we'll bear that in mind when we come to the later part of this presentation. Okay. Now, it's important to understand the chief executive and other senior executives motivation. Now, you may say, well, that's obvious, it's making money. Well, there may be some chief executives who want to give employment to people and or have an idea and they want to make a success of something. And that's all true. Motivation is, you know, can be uh, multifaceted. But let's just narrow it down somewhat. And remember they there are private companies and then there's stock market listed companies. They're, they're called public companies as well. Um, so we are running a private company and our motivation to a certain degree is to depress earnings, okay? Now, um, if we were face to face, I would ask people to kind of say why they think that is the case to give me some reasons for this but unfortunately we're not. So I will give you some potential reasons why we would want to depress earnings uh, in our mobile phone company. It may be because we don't want to pay too much tax. And it may be because we don't want to alert the competition as to how much money we're making, uh, the margin um, that we're making, because they may undercut us if, um, they, they can see how much money we're really making. So we're going to try and make out we're not doing as well as we may be. Okay. Now, now the motivation of a chief executive from a public company, a stock market listed company like Coca-Cola or um, uh, Facebook or Google, all of these stock market listed companies, um, is the opposite. They want to enhance earnings. Now, the reason for that is what really does go to the heart 
of, of financial journalism in, in many ways. Okay, the reason why uh, a chief executive wants to um, enhance earnings effectively is to trigger their bonuses. Bonuses are a massive component of a chief executive or a finance uh, director's salaries. So they are going to try and show and sweat the company to make as much money as they can so that the investors buy into the company, raise the share price, and so their bonuses are triggered, okay? Now, there are several indicators that the chief executive will be looking at uh, to, um, he, which he'll be trying to increase. And the, probably the key one is um, an indicator known as an earnings per share. And you'll see this number um, on a financial statement. And you know, you are forgiven for not knowing what, what, is, what this number means. Um, but it can, if you hit this number, it can send a senior executive salary sky high. And it's pretty simple, really. It's a simple uh, formula. It's the profit after tax, remember that $300,000 example, divided by the average number of shares. If that number goes up, it's very likely the shares will go up. If that number goes down when a company has its financial statements, the shares will go down. So the markets are looking at that number and the executives are looking at that number even more closely. So they want to really make as much profit as they can. And maybe they might want to buy some shares to reduce the amount of shares so that that number can go up. And that happens. It's called a share buyback. I'm not come on to that. You can see you can see that in operation in the cash flow statement. OK, so simple terms, the earning per share lifts the share price, triggers the executive share scheme, and then drum roll delivers the bonus. I hope that's clear and helpful. Okay, more concepts. You, or rather I, am a dodgy executive and I want to make the accounts look better than they are. I have two basic options. I either overstate revenue, so that sale item that at the top of the uh, example we saw, um, income turnover sales, I wanna overstate that, or I wanna understate the cost of sales in order to make out that I've got more money in the company than we may have. Um, so this may involve fictitious or overvalued assets or understated liabilities, okay? Fraud can be quite simple when you boil it down. And this basic principle explains the collapse of some of the world's biggest companies. Um, Enron at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, those banks that fell in the Western banking crisis, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, um, a Satyan Computers, an Indian giant, uh, Carillion, a, a UK stock market listed company. Now, I've linked here, you'll get access to this presentation, and I've linked Carillion to a House of Commons report, uh, which is worth reading because it really describes the collapse and the process in accounting terms, and it's quite simple. Um, so um, that's another company. It's a big infrastructure company that has operations all over the world, um, and it basically overstated um, its revenue lines. And we'll come on to that. We'll see that um, uh, in a later part of this uh, uh, presentation. Okay, right. So companies are, uh, particularly multinational ones, are, are quite complicated. They, they may have operating companies in um, uh, Kenya, or, or, or Nigeria or Burkina Faso, that, that those mining companies or telecom companies um, are, are, are source companies. That they, they literally it means they're the source of the revenue. Um, and a lot of multinationals will try and shift as much of that revenue from the source company to, 
to to the to the HQ company or the resident company, which may be based in Toronto or Beijing or another country. Um, so, how do these major companies do that? Well, we've got seven main techniques. They may sell the shares of that company um, to, to get to get to extract some of that profit. Um, and that you can see that in the cash flow statement. They may take out dividends from that source company. Um, and we can see that in the cash flow statement and the director's report. They may charge that, that resident company or a finance company, which is part of the same family of a multinational family, may um, charge interest on a loan that they're making. And we can see that in the notes. They may charge management fees. So the, the resident company may charge management fees or intellectual property uh, fees, um, and that can be uh, detected in the notes. So there we go, the intellectual property charges. We can see that in the related parties transactions um, uh, in the notes, and we'll, we'll look at that later. Um, now, a lot of you may have heard of transfer pricing. This is internal trading of, of components and um, other items that uh, uh, the source company may need in order to, to mine um, copper or, or zinc or whatever. So transfer pricing happens in this internal trading and that's not easy to detect uh, in accounting terms. You really need revenue officials to go into a company and, 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 and audit um, all of the uh, transactions that have taken place. And that doesn't happen very often because revenue authorities haven't got the capacity to, to do this, which, uh, which, so, which accounts for why transfer pricing is such a, uh, a popular way of avoiding tax for, for multinationals. Uh, finally, uh, there's this uh, 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 phenomenon called trade misinvoicing, which is illegal, uh, which is the fraudulent misinvoicing or, or mispricing of internal trades. Um, and uh, that's, that can be possibly detected in trade data. Um, uh, and uh, it, again, it's a very uh, uh, important uh, a way of sucking money out of source companies, uh, but you can't really detect that so much from financial statements. So just to give you an idea of the complexity of a multinational, this is the world's biggest gold company, Barrick Gold, based in Toronto, Canada. So on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and this organogram came from a filing that I, I found in the, uh, in the Toronto uh, kind of filings. Um, and it's kind of helpful to see the complexity. Obviously, you can't really see the different companies, but take my word for it that the, the mines are at the bottom of the chain in these oval shapes. Um, and they may be based in Chile or, or Tanzania uh, and, uh, and in um, East Asia. Um, and then slowly but surely you're loaded on to finance companies in, all, in many, many different jurisdictions. Um, and they'll be kind of charging uh, the source company for different items, whether it's finance, intellectual property, management, and the idea of the game is to get the money up to the top company, the quoted entity, which is the consolidated uh, uh, company. Um, and we can see the accounts generally of those companies. If any of these subsidiaries were based in the Netherlands or, or Belgium, Luxembourg, Ireland, we'd be, we'd be able to see the financials of these companies as well. So it's not impossible to, to do a financial uh, trail of, of even a big gold company. A lot of the, these subsidiaries are based in the BVI um, and Bermuda, and, and they obviously are harder to get the financial statements, uh, but you can get certain financial information um, from those jurisdictions. Okay, so we have now uh, finished the um, conceptual part of this presentation. Um, I don't know whether, uh, people have got any questions before we um, wade into the, um, the kind of to, to give you a, 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 an idea as to how financial statements are structured. Is, it, is, there any, is there any questions, Ted, that you think are worth drawing out at this stage? 
No, we had one question, Nick, um, about dividends, uh, how company directors um, decided what dividends uh, um, they, they would pay. And I explained um, uh, that a, a, a good, good set of directors will uh, assess the company's long-term health, what it can afford, uh, what future cash flows it uh, expects, what future investment plans it has, and how profitable it thinks it's going to be in the future, and then we'll recommend a dividend per share um, to the shareholders who will then vote on it and approve it. Uh, whereas a, a bad set of directors, as you just said, uh, will aim to suck uh, profits out of the company and, and a much more sort of short-term uh, view about it, uh, about enhancing their own wealth if they are themselves uh, significant shareholders in the company. Good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and also there was another further question, Nick, which is the, which is the usual yeah. one that we, um, we hear a lot of is um, in, in, in so many countries, it's, 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 um, it's difficult to get um, company accounts. Um, yeah. So, uh, and on government procurement and spending, the major problem always, the, the question is, said is, is, is access to information, especially documents on financial releases and audited financial statements. So how can a journalist navigate through such challenges in order to produce evidence-based uh, investor report? Well, that's always the, that's always the, the, the major challenge for, for journalists. And there are too many countries which um, <clears throat> don't have transparency at the top of their priorities. And um, there, as I said that there's no easy answer to this. Uh, it, it's, it's part of the journalist job to cultivate sources and, um, and, and trying to obtain information which people don't want us to see. And it's the usual thing about um, getting leaks. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any easy solution to that. Well, I mean, that, yeah, we got it. We would all talk about accessing company statements, but it is obviously the key issue. Um, I think, first of all, obviously, an understanding of, of financial statements is important, but then it's getting hold of, of, of financial statements. And um, I mean, in the UK, we, 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 we are rubbish at so many things. And, but um, one thing that is good in the UK is the disclosure of financial statements by all companies which are, have to do that or they get fined and um, I, it's really like so important for countries to to allow for the um, uh, disclosure of, of, of full disclosure of company statements um, that, that that idea that public uh, or that li companies have limited liability i.e the directors don't have to um, won't get um, uh, or aren't liable for a company's debts in the event of, uh, of it going under. Um, the quid pro quo should be that uh, companies have to uh, report uh, and make public their financial statements. Um, it helps for uh, stakeholders, customers, clients, uh, workers, uh, and the general public um, and, and government officials even um, uh, to understand what's going on with the company. Um, and, and, and I've always you know, had a bit of a dream, maybe naive, that, it, that journalists do get together and actually demand a consistent, uh, you know, don't have a campaign to, 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 to force uh, countries where they don't um, allow for this. However, um, you know, in, in many com countries, it's if you're dealing with multinationals, it's possible to build up um, a reasonably good financial picture of a company and how it um, and how uh, maybe an operating company in in a in a in a non uh, say for instance in an African country is doing. So um, it's not totally you know uh, a lost cause, but um, yeah. I mean, it is. You, we, Nick, Nick, I'll just rattle through some other questions which have just come on since you, since you were talking just now. Um, I don't want to delay too much, but um, we've had one uh, from uh, Callistus who says, Where can one find the average number of uh, shares? Um, well, the number of shares uh, that are an issue in the company is in the notes to the accounts. 
uh, there's a specific note for that. Um, uh, and then uh, we had another is in, in accounts, it's not possible for um, uh, the chief exec to, I think it might be a typo, it says Jeremy up, but I think it means just a, a gerrymander or whatever to up the consultancy and management fees. Uh, if this happens, how is it uh, for the journalist to detect? Well, again, that lo looking in accounts and seeing where the management fees are are too high. I think Nick, you'll be coming on to um, yeah. that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an extractive technique. It's, 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 it's often the case that happens. And it's, a, it's about benchmarking and uh, looking at what's uh, realistic and having informed knowledge on that. Um, and uh, Nicholas from Nigeria says, how can a journalist or financial analyst know when a company uh, overstates or understates its sales to increase uh, share size. Um, uh, Nick, you might want to deal with that one. And then we've got our friend Jeff Munga. Uh, how do companies calculate intellectual, intellectual property charges as they try to suck out revenue from source uh, countries? Well, intellectual property charges is uh, an, another way. <laughs> it's another way of uh, it's, it's, it all goes on the question of sort of goodwill on the balance sheet. It's very complex. Uh, and subjective calculation that's made by the company's accountants on um, and it's, it's, it's meant to be on the net present value of uh, the cash flows that a company can reasonably expect to derive from uh, a, a piece of intellectual property or you know for example a brand or whatever it's um or a bit of a software I, 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 IT it's a subjective charge and um, there's no easy answer to, to that, to that, Jeff. It's it's a, it's a matter of, of, of feeling it, uh, contextualizing it, again seeking expert opinion on that. Um, but it is a way that can, uh, companies can. Uh, there, there are rules around it, um, but an, an audit is meant to check it. Uh, but it, it's it's one to always look at. Uh, and Razia asks, what do you mean by? Uh, what do you mean private equity firms don't pay corporation tax? I'm not sure you quite said that. I think private equity firms do pay corporation tax. Um, limited liability companies don't. Limited liability partnerships don't pay corporation yeah. tax. And then we've got the last one. With the explanation so far, does it mean that auditors are collaborators to these ev ev evasions? <laughs> uh, where, 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 <laughs> where, 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 um, people are intent on committing fraud, they are intent on committing fraud. And there can be many parties to that, and that can include um, friends they have as auditors. Uh, it can be sort of large conspiracies that way. It's more often the case. So it's, the, it's the classic question in journalism, is it, is it conspiracy or, or cock-up? And we should always start from the cock-up the cock theory. And if we find evidence there's a conspiracy, then we go for that. The issue with auditors is, um, uh, and, and Nick will come on to it, is, is that auditors have potential conflicts of interest and they do other work for the companies uh, which they audit and they derive more fees, more profitable fees from doing consultancy to type work. Uh, it's, it's, it's a classic um, um, issue in the auditing industry. And also um, auditors have, it's often over, over stated what the role of an auditor is that that they go through every single number and check they can't do that they don't do that um they have to do sample based auditing and that sampling has to be done on uh, past experience of auditing the company and it is basically an educated guess in a lot of ways and they have to be satisfied uh, that they check say you know x percent of the invoices for determining sales revenue and can they be satisfied like that? Often, not often, I'm not going to say often, sometimes auditors will turn a blind eye if they are in cahoots with the management. But remember, it's cock up, not conspiracy most of the time. Okay, indeed. That's it. Um, yeah, um, on the intellectual property charges, there are benchmarks, there are databases that um, give um, the, 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 the typical percentage uh, for a specific industry, say the telecoms industry or the software industry, the media industry, they will have a, an average 
uh, intellectual property charge. I, I can share that. Uh, uh, there's a there's a, a uh, some data that I've got that shows that. Um, so then you just have to basically do a percentage on the revenue line against the intellectual property charge to see whether the all intellectual property charge is um, uh, out of line with the average. And we'll come on to um, how do we know if revenues have been overstated or not. Um, Sure. Okay, so so uh, thanks all for those questions. I, uh, to those who have asked questions, I'm just going to, uh, because I've answered them verbally, I'm just going to um, uh, uh, mark them as answered in, in, in the Q&A box, but uh, keep them coming. Thanks. Okay, well, okay. Thank you so much. There were some excellent questions there. Um, right, so let's now, we've done the concept, we've looked at motivation, we've looked at the different types of companies, uh, we've looked at the bonus incentives, um, the kind of like the, uh, how the P&L is, profit and loss statement is kind of structured in simple terms. Let's now look at financial statements and how they're structured. First of all, we have the director's report. Um, it shows that it adheres to financial accounting and CSR standards, corporate social responsibility standards. They are worth reading. You can get a surprising amount of stories from the director's report. Um, we'll show you in a minute. Then, as we've just been talking about, you have the auditor's report, which is an opinion as to whether the accounts are true and fair. If there's a problem with it, an audit, if the auditor uh, raises a flag, um, then you may well have a very interesting lead. Uh, this only happens maybe 1% of the time because as uh, you have indicated in, uh, or the questioner indicated, and as Ted has also explained, the auditor does have a conflict, often has a conflict of interest. And so um, uh, uh, that, that it's generally the case that these are tick box exercises. Okay, so those are the uh, two sections before we get to the financial statements. Before we talk about the profit and loss though, for public companies, stock market listed companies, often you may get a remuneration report coming after the auditor's report. Um, for American stock market listed companies, you'll get an appendix that gives the remuneration report, the salary report. Um, for many companies, after the auditor's report, then you will get the first of three financial statements. The first one, Often, but not always, they mix it up the orders sometimes. But the first one is the profit and loss account. And this is the flagship financial statement summarizing the revenues, costs, and expenses over a quarter of a year, six months, or 12 months, sometimes known as the statement of comprehensive income. So language can be used interchangeably. Afterwards, Sometimes it afterwards you get the balance sheet. Sometimes the balance sheet is first though, so it can be confusing. A balance sheet is details rather all of a company's assets, what it owns, and all of its liabilities. It also includes the amount of money shareholders have put into the company, known as shareholder equity. And all this information is on just one day. It's a snapshot. And so this is a, a, a one statement that is quite easy to manipulate because you may have more assets today um, than you may than tomorrow, or your liabilities may suddenly increase tomorrow. But today they are kept in check. Sometimes a company can inject finance into uh, itself just as it's reporting on its uh, financial statements to inflate its position sometimes known as a statement of financial position. After that, you tend to get the cash flow statement, which is a very important uh, uh, statement. It gives you the real cash position of a company and how changes in balance sheets and income affect cash and cash equivalents, such as investments. After these three sections, you will get the notes. Um, which is where you can find quite a number of stories. Um, and this details um, ultimate ownership, related party transactions and revenue recognition policies. Right, let's now go through these sections one at a time. I'm sure most of you uh, read about the Oxfam sex scandal, which broke in February, 2018. About two years prior to that, 
you would have had a lead on that sex scandal if you had read its annual report and in particular the director's report. Um, because in the director's report, it gives an indication that in that particular financial year, 2015-16, Oxfam saw an increase in the number of reported allegations from 26 to 64. That's quite a significant uh, number of, of cases involving sexual exploitation and abuse perpetrated by Oxfam staff and partners. Um, if you carry on reading this, you will see that a number of cases have been um, referred to statutory authorities. So your news antennae would be twitching at that point. And this is in easily found um, kind of words in the director's report. No financial experience really necessary. Just to um, emphasize this point, the following year, um, the number of allegations um, went up from, well, they say 76, but if you were uh, reading the last year's report, it, it was 64. So suddenly we've got another few cases have rolled in uh, uh, to the previous year to 87. This is going up and up. They investigated 33 allegations. Uh, uh, 53 of these allegations or, or incidents rather required referral to statutory services, including the police, et cetera. So, this is um, useful for us to bear in mind, reading the director's report. Um, we um, did a story on uh, capital gains tax avoidance involving a Vietnamese um, a subsidiary of, of the US oil giant ConocoPhillips. They disclosed a half a billion tax-free gain in its company, uh, in its director's report. In black and white, we could see the group recognized a pre-tax profit of 563, uh, 566 million pounds. It, it, um, in the business review, if you read it, you may get yourself a lead. We, we, were, we were aware that this might have been the case, but this helped us confirm um, uh, 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 and, and give us an idea as to how much money was at stake. Um, so that, that story also got ran in The Guardian. So it was all through that director's report. And it was a, a Vietnamese subsidiary um, owned by a British holding company, um, freely accessible by, uh, to anybody via the, the company's house corporate registry. Um, this um, uh, is a, just one other example, I won't go through it, but director's reports um, have to say whether they are going concerns, whether the company is able to trade for another 12 months, whether it has the financial resource to trade. So the going concern uh, section of a director's report is worth reading. And in this incident, um, this is a, a football club, uh, a founder member of the Football League in, in the UK, now falling on hard times. We can see the financial crisis is brewing at this company, uh, this football club. And this was in, uh, uh, two, that this would have been filed or disclosed in, um, 2015, at the moment, uh, or the, 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 the club subsequently had points deducted and, uh, and, and nearly went out of business. Um, okay, back to the director's report. Um, now onto the auditor's report. Um, uh, there are two types of auditors. Those who work internally, directly employed by the companies, um, and um, these are Ted's words actually, um, their reports are usually confidential from managers' eyes only. Um, uh, and uh, as Ted would say, if you can source these, you're onto a good thing because they very rarely come to light internal. But you also get external auditors um, and they work for an outside firm and they're there to uh, make sure that uh, the accounts are true, fair and accurate. But we know that they have a conflict of interest because often they do other advisory work for a company. So in only 1% of the case, uh, we will find any issues um, raised in the accounts. Um, okay. So um, if um, there's a problem with uh, an account, they will be modified. If they are clean, they are unmodified. Um, those are key words that you need to remember if you're, when you scan an audit, uh, audit report um, um, and you get different types of modified uh, reports. 
uh, audit reports. Um, and if they are problematic, which is a word that they use, then you have to see whether they are pervasive or not pervasive. Sometimes uh, an auditor will issue a disclaimer uh, and this means that they can't find the information they need to put, make a proper uh, opinion on it. And that's, that's, that's a problem. Um, um, sometimes uh, uh, they will issue an adverse opinion. Uh, that's very serious. Sometimes an auditor will resign. Um, these are not disclosed in the accounts, but are in, sometimes disclosed in corporate filings. But if you hear of an auditor resigning as opposed to uh, then, then, then that is again a red flag. Um, but sometimes we kind of overstate the importance of auditors' reports because we kind of look at the financial statements first and then double back to the audit report to see if there's any uh, thing um, uh, arising there. Just to give you a couple of examples of uh, interesting audit reports, here we have uh, a fast jet. Uh, uh, and uh, I believe it's a, an Africa, uh, African based, uh, relatively low cost uh, airline. Uh, forgive me if I've got that wrong, but it's a, um, but here we have um, an auditor suggesting that in the absence of proper accounting records, we are unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence on the value of assets of 1.4 million and the completeness of liabilities of 18.1 million. Um, so, um, they have qualified their uh, audit opinion. Um, they are worried that they can't see uh, the financial accounting record. So that's a red flag. I mean, it's not um, a smoking gun, but it shows that there are problems internally in the company. Um, and here we have a disclaimer. Um, uh, here, uh, the, uh, the, the holding company has not been able to substantiate any evidence that the group are able to continue to trade as a going concern. Uh, the group has provided no detailed financial projections demonstrating its ability to continue as a go going concern. So without the, this, these projections, um, they can't, the auditors can't actually um, make a proper opinion on these financial statements. Um, uh, so, uh, and they don't, they're not, uh, they don't believe that this company uh, is able to operate as a going concern. So, okay, so we've done the director's report, we've done the auditor's report. Now we come to the first flagship financial statement, which is the income statement, otherwise known as the profit and loss. And this is quite a simple statement, really. Uh, this particular financial statement is uh, Britain's most financially successful house builder. And it's made huge amounts of money by building luxury flats on the banks of the River Thames that have subsequently been sold to, to people all over the world, some of which um, will be quite dubious characters. Um, this company has been the chief beneficiary of huge amounts of hot money coming into London. Um, and Curiously, it's expert at reducing its affordable housing obligations. Um, so we've done some stories looking into this company um, over the years. Um, so here we have the income statement and you will notice that it's for the year ending 30th of April. Um, you will see that there's a note section which uh, against which certain items have got notes and we will use those notes. Um, um, you'll see that this is the year in question, 2017 tends to be in bold. We are using, the currency is great uh, GB pounds or sterling with factoring in millions. And we have the previous year's uh, 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 figures to give us a comparison, which is very useful. Um, we can see that the revenue line has grown significantly if we compare it. Um, and then we have our cost of sales, which then gives way to our gross profit. And at that point, we can um, calculate a gross profit margin, which is a us useful benchmark to see the financial um, uh, health or otherwise of a company. And importantly, how it may compare 
with other companies in the same sector. Now, how do we create or calculate a gross profit margin? Like this. We have our gross profit and we divide that by the revenue and times it by 100 to create a percentage. In this case, it's around 30%. 939 million pounds, nearly a billion against 2.7 billion. It's around 30%. Now, um, if you're doing well as a house builder, you're having a margin of around about 20%, under 20%, and you may be liable to be taken over. You might not be very efficient. Your, your costs may be too much, um, or your sale, or you're not getting enough sales, and your managers will be um, under pressure. Um, I know the, how do I know this? Because you ask maybe a financial expert, an analyst to work and, and, and ask them to contextualize that figure. Um, this company is doing extremely well. So when it pleads poverty and says it can't afford to build ho um, affordable houses, you know that it may be um, slightly misleading. Um, using the words carefully because they can be quite litigious um, and aggressive. Um, so as we go down the profit and loss, we have our operating profit. Uh, so that's the executive pay, headquarter staff, marketing costs. And you could create an operating profit margin by dividing the 750 into the 2.7 billion. Um, we then have our finance costs and income so they they may lend money to uh, joint venture partners um, they have costs uh, but they're very small if you see um, now oh importantly i should uh, mention when you see figures in brackets that's money going out of the company it's a negative number so in this context it's money going out of the company um, so the cost of sales is money going out um, Okay, um, now we go to our profit before tax. So this is, the, um, this is where the tax will be levied at. Um, and uh, we can see that's gone up considerably from the previous year, as has the tax, which is not surprising because they're making more money. So as a percentage uh, of their, of their pre-tax profits, they'll be paying more tax if that number has gone up. And here is the, um, the golden number the profit after tax, the bottom line, again, that's gone up considerably, uh, about 50%, um, just roughly, um, uh, we can see that. Um, it's, it's kind of important to, to kind of be fairly good at percentages um, if you're doing financial reporting. Um, and if you're a bit rusty, just kind of YouTube it and just re-familiarize yourself with uh, percentage calculations. Um, um, there's no shame in that whatsoever. Um, and here we have the earnings per share. Um, and we can see that that has gone up. So in all likelihood, the share price would have gone up. So we now have become financial analysts because we, we, we can see certain indicators and think, ah, oh, that's how the market will react. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to come back to this because um, we might talk about exceptional items, these unexpected events, and you can track them by using the notes to understand what's really going on. Um, but just look at it. This is a real blizzard of information. And, you know, this is a problem with financial reporting. It can be very confusing. We have before exceptional items, exceptional items. Then we have the kind of 2014, this, this is the um, year we're dealing with. Um, and then you've got, again, another three columns, and then you've got the comparator. So it's hard to kind of get your bearings, um, but you know, we, that, we have to cut through that. Um, uh, these are hurdles that we have to kind of, so um, uh, yeah, that, that's it. Well, now the, the, this company is a, a retail company. It was owned by Britain's biggest retail tycoon who was incredibly greedy and paid his wife, his wife's company, uh, a dividend of over one billion pounds um, and therefore escaped a lot of tax because that dividend went to a company in Monaco, the tax haven of Monaco. Very controversial figure, very uh, 
uh, and it's got a lot of uh, controversies linked to his name. Uh, um, so, but this was, this accounts was the, this company, he helped him get rich, but now it's in serious problems. We can see this because it's turnover, because it's cost of sales, is more than its turnover. This is something you might not often see. This indicates a company in big, big trouble. If your cost of sales are more than your turnover, you have got a big chance of going under. But guess what? The auditors didn't uh, raise any red flags on this. Um, so it had made a gross loss um, and then compounded by its administrative expenses making a bigger loss. Um, and that loss had increase from the previous year so this is a company that's heading for the rocks and we can see this quite clearly in the profit and loss statement okay we'll come back to um we'll come back to um that exceptional item because you can find out more about what caused uh, that uh, the meltdown in those companies finances but let's now look at the balance sheet um, and some of you may know the identity of that person with the mic. And if anyone can find the connection uh, between the balance sheet and this singer, Whitney Houston, if you write it into the chat box now, and if you get the right answer, we will send you a prize. I'm not sure what the prize is yet, but if you can find, it's like a crossword clue. What links Whitney Houston with a balance sheet? I'll put your answer in now. Three, two, one. Okay. So a balance sheet. Everything a company owns is assets minus everything it's owed, its liabilities. In one moment in time, ladies and gentlemen, Whitney Houston's famous song, One Moment in Time. Whenever you see a balance sheet, think of Whitney in one moment in time. Okay, that's what it's all about. Assets are split in two types to reflect the ease of liquidating them, i.e. selling them for cash. Current assets, these are assets that can, can be easily converted into cash within 12 months. So those are current assets. Then you may have long-term assets or fixed assets that the company will use for more than 12 months and are harder to liquidate. So they, they are two categories of assets. And it won't surprise you that cash is the most liquid of all assets. Um, and real estate or machinery is less likely to sell quickly. Now, the thing about assets is that what they say on the balance sheet as their value may not be in reality the value when they are being sold. For instance, if you had uh, last, if you were a company that um, couldn't sell that generation of mobile phones and then had to sell them next year, who wants last year's mobile phone? That mobile phone that you put as an asset at $50 per set will be worth much less. Um, so um, just because you have assets doesn't mean to say that they are worth what you say they are or they will um, fetch what you think that they will fetch. And that can be um, something to bear in mind when you're interrogating companies. Okay, on the one hand, we have assets. On the other hand, we have liabilities, all debts and obligations owed by the business. These are on the balance sheet on the other side of the assets. Like assets, there are two types um, of liabilities, short-term liabilities payable within one year. And that is the most, one of the, possibly one of the most important line items on the balance sheet. If that number um, compares unfavorably with a revenue um, or its proportion uh, against revenue is going up over time, then you have a red flag as to the health of a particular company. Long-term liabilities are payable over beyond more than one year. They are not so pressing. On the balance sheet, we also have the equity, the amount of money shareholders have put into the company. 
Okay, so this is a balance sheet of our good friend, Barclay Group, that uh, very successful house builder. Now, um, if we look at the cut, if we look at its assets, what do you think its assets are? If we look through, we can see its non-current assets. Um, uh, and we, we see uh, investments in joint ventures and nothing that interesting. Let me look at current assets and we see inventories. Remembering this is in pounds million, we see this number here, the inventories in current assets. And this is 3.5 billion pounds worth of inventories. Now, there's a note next to it. And if we went to our note, um, note 12, we will see that inventories are in fact land this is the company's major asset it's land and it's increased in value over the last 12 months um, house builders most valuable asset is obviously land um, now interestingly they put this in the current assets uh, with the idea that it could all be sold in one year which actually is questionable could you sell three and a half billion pounds worth of land in one year um, it's cash and cash equivalents it's liquid assets they have shot up. This is a cash rich company. It's got nearly 600 million pounds in cash, up nearly uh, 500 million, uh, 400, there's so over 400 million increase. Um, so there we have, now um, let's check its liabilities. Uh, we can see its total assets is uh, four and a half billion. Um, so we can see how, much, how big a component that land is. Um, yeah. Um, this company has, looks like it's um, taken out a 300 million pound loan. It didn't have any borrowings last year. It's now taken out a 300 million pound loan, which is interesting. You, you may go to note 23 to see what's going on there now. And you may want to ask the com company, well, you've got so much cash, why are you borrowing more money, 300 million? Um, it may be that they're going on a, uh, trying to buy more land. Um, but you can see that, that that's from this balance sheet is yields a question. Um, uh, and this is a, a, a non-current liability. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, um, check the current liabilities uh, because these are the most pressing uh, uh, issues that the company is facing. And trade and other payables is the biggest component, which will be, um, no doubt, it's uh, money to its suppliers uh, and possibly their uh, owners of land. Uh, we can check the definition of their trade and other payables or see if there's any more details if we went to note 15. Um, but um, if we remember that uh, the company made revenues of 2.7 billion pounds from its um, from its profit and loss, we can see that it, it, it's got the headroom to, um, to, to meet that uh, 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 its current liabilities. Um, those are the main uh, issues that you might want to draw from the balance sheet. Um, to be honest, I don't often look at the shareholder equity line. Um, so I'm going to skip that. Here's one other final um, uh, balance sheet. Uh, and this is um, BHS, that disastrous uh, retail company. And here we can see that the tangible assets, its fixed assets have fallen and we can see what they define as the fixed, uh, tangible assets if we went to note 10. Um, now, um, its stock has increased um, and bearing in mind that this is a fashion uh, retailer, this may be a sign that it's not selling its goods. Um, so this could be an indication of a problem. Um, so, and we can see that its cash position um, is deteriorated. Again, another red flag. Um, now, the amount of creditors that are falling due within one year has increased significantly. And this is putting pressure on the company, remembering that it's got a revenue line of about 660 million pounds, so nearly half. Um, uh, is now accounted for in creditors falling within one year. Um, so it has a net liabilities instead of it, it. A healthy company will have net current assets. 
net assets, but this has got net liabilities in, in brackets, money that it's a negative uh, uh, figure. So that's uh, something to uh, bear in mind. Um, so um, if, you if you go down, you can see um, that it actually also has a pension deficit, which has um, more than doubled in the 12 months to produce a net liabilities line of 256 million. And that's a significant increase on the previous year. So this is a balance sheet, which is not a happy picture. Okay, so that completes our look at the balance sheet. Now we're going to move on to the final financial statement, uh, the cash flow statement. Um, and this again is our, our familiar friend, Barclay Group, a luxury house building company. Um, and we can see that um, cash generated from operations, i.e. selling houses, that's its operations. Um, it may explain more about this in the note 22, has nearly doubled. Uh, it's had a fantastically successful year. Um, and so um, um, if you, uh, it's it, out of the cash flow statement, it will give you um, the amount of tax it's paid. But actually, if we're, we're calculating a company's effective tax rate, we will use the, the tax provision on the profit and loss statement. Um, it has a uh, net cash flow that has, again, increased. Um, often, journalists will go to the bottom, actually, of a cash flow statement to see its cash position. It's all, uh, at the end of the year to see to what extent it's improved or uh, had its cash position deteriorated. And here we can see the cash position has gone up from 585 to 987 million pounds. And in fact, we can see it's gone up from 107 at the beginning of 2017 by the end. So we have three data points, uh, 107, 585, and 987. So we've seen a 400 million pound cash increase. Um, here we, we get to see um, the dividends. This is important. We can see the, uh, the dividend line on the cash flow statement. Um, so 254 million was given to the shareholders last year. This year it's gone down to 146. Um, there's a question as to why that has gone down. Uh, the shareholders will definitely be asking that question. Um, the company has purchased its own shares. That might be a reason because it's invested some of that money to reduce the amount of shares in circulation, which is helping keeping the share price up and also increasing the amount of, uh, if there's less shareholders, uh, they may get more dividend income. Um, buying shares uh, a company buying shares is an indication that it's got a huge amount of money um, um, or that it's trying to drive up its share price or both. So the key things on the cash flow statement are checking its cash position, its dividends, uh, potentially purchasing its own shares or issuing shares, um, and then um, cash generated from operations. Uh, this is uh, one further cash flow statement. And here, as journalists, as I was saying, we generally go to the bottom, bottom line to see the net improvement or decrease in the cash position. And here we can see this company, which is a real, it's a, an estate agency, a property consultancy. It's massively increased its cash position. And I'm wondering if there's an explanation. We can see it's gone up by nearly 600 million pounds. Um, so why has that happened? And if we go up, we can, if we look in the finance, financing activities section of the cash flow, we can see that there has been an increase in bank loans and overdrafts of over half a billion pounds. Um, 525 million. So we now can see that this company has had a bank loan or uh, injected into it, which would then make us think what interest is being charged, which is the bank that has issued that loan, 
and how long is that loan for? And why indeed was that loan made? Is this, is this company in trouble? And actually, um, the answer to that is this loan was given in the midst of the Western banking crisis and the credit crunch. And this was a company selling properties at a time when um, their, uh, banks weren't giving mortgages. So it's, it's revenue dwindled. So it needed an injection of cash to keep going. Um, just to remind you that in the finance activities, you can get to see the dividends paid, um, um, no purchase of shares, although the previous year there were purchase of shares. Um, and in the cash flow, you can see whether uh, the amount of interest paid or interest received um, and various purchases that have been made. It's a relatively simple statement. Um, and yet it's very good to understand the, the health of a company. Okay, um, a template for you to analyze companies. Um, we will come back to that, uh, but it's really good to look at um, company accounts over time, five, six years, um, and you can um, pick up uh, the revenues and cost of sales, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, I'll actually show um, um, here, I don't hope you can see here, uh, on that Barclay Group example, we can see here, if we put in, this is a limited, what we call trend tracker, um, we can see that since 2013, the revenues in Barclay Group have more than doubled and its gross margin has improved considerably um, and its post-tax profits have tripled um, and um, the amount of tax it's paid has gone up a lot and yet curiously the tax rate has gone down. You may think that is an indication of tax avoidance. However, the UK tax rate has also decreased during that time. So actually there is no tax avoidance here, but you can still see enough information, uh, revenue surging, uh, margins increasing, uh, post-tax uh, profits exploding, um, enough to make a graph. Uh, some good graphs and also um, this did produce some stories actually for the Guardian etc um, which is so it, it's good to put all this information out um, over a period of time okay um, and we're going to give you a, one of these trend trackers uh, uh, and we're going to ask you to look at uh, Guinness Nigeria um, so uh, the GIJM will be emailing you um, the participants, a trend tracker, and we'll, cut, we'll show you, uh, actually, shall we do that now? Why not? We're, we're talking trend trackers. Um, so um, this is what you're going to be receiving as an Excel. We have filled out the three years, and all you have to do is get the 2019 accounts of Guinness Nigeria, uh, which is a quoted company in Nigeria. And we want you to go into the accounts and get this information, which you will do um, in our next session, um, going through the profit and loss statement. And we'll spend, you'll spend hopefully an hour doing that next week. And then we'll spend an hour talking about the results and other financial reporting issues. So um, to think, so what you will do is that you will go to the Guinness Nigeria website, and you will go into the investor section and pull out the annual report of 2019. You'll get the annual report of 2019 and um, download that and then pull out information and then input it into this year. And because as you now know, financial statements have that you're, if you have 2019 figures, uh, if you have the 2019 report, you'll also have the 2018 figures and you can just, so then you will have um, five years worth of financial statements and then we will see what type of trends and stories we can discern. Okay, let's go back to the, thing, the presentation. So we have now completed 
the uh, five major sections of the financial statements, the director's report, the auditor's report, the P&L, balance sheet and cash flow. Um, so now we're, talk, we're at the notes stage. So we have 32 minutes. Um, so we will go through this now um, and hopefully we'll have questions at the end, unless there's burning questions, Ted. Uh, no, there's no burning questions. A lot of the there's been loads of questions, and a lot of the questions have related to the notes actually. Um, uh -huh. Okay, right. Um, so shall we press on? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's stuff about revenue recognition I've answered and uh, contingent liabilities, um, uh, going concern uh, uh, questions that I've not asked specifically about those things, but actually the answers uh, relate to those those things. Um, is it is it is it press on time, Nick? Is it or is it break time? I, I can't remember if it was an hour and a half. To well, start with. I mean, we we meant. I, I think we were we were scheduled for a two hour session, and it's we're we're, we're ninety minutes in. Right. So, um, if people are okay now to kind of, we're in the last section now. So, should we? I think we should probably press on. If that, if people are okay, hope so. Hope that it's not too overwhelming. Um, or just sitting down in front of a screen, but um, ideally we would have a couple of minutes to walk around it or, or, or take some air, but I think we should press on. I don't know whether what Andrea and, and Ben on think. Uh, there are messages in the, in the chat box saying we should press on. So I guess- uh, Cool, let's do yeah. it. And, and just, just to answer uh, David, who's asked whether are we getting the template to help? This is the trend tracker. Nick, that's being sent, isn't it? Yes, uh, Andrea at GIJN has that has it, and so she will be sending it to the participants. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's look at the notes. There can be over thirty separate note items, but let's boil them down to as journalists to what we think are the most important: accounting policies, revenue recognition, and going concern. Um, they tend to be bunched up together, and we'll deal with that. Exceptional items, I'll double back uh, to that BHS example. Um, these are unexpected events that can um, uh, knock a company's finances in that particular year. Staff costs, wages, directors pay, really good information. Always excite news editors, this stuff. Um, interest payable and similar charges, particularly for those people who are interested in tax stories. Um, this is how companies uh, can shift profits. Tax is an incredibly important issue. Uh, multinationals avoiding tax. There are steps uh, at the moment to try and uh, solve the, the kind of systemic uh, loopholes and failures in the international uh, taxation system at the OECD and G20 level, um, it's not clear whether those uh, uh, solutions that have, are close to agreement with a number of countries will actually solve the situation, but it's an urgent issue. Uh, there's a huge amount of profits that get shifted and therefore denying um, health, education and social opportunities, not just in Africa, but actually in virtually every single region in the world. Um, contingent liabilities. Um, these are uh, legal issues that may have a, uh, a, a damaging impact on a company, but um, have not actually happened as yet, but they are, can provide excellent stories for journalists. And there's a section in them in the notes to look into. Events after the reporting period sometimes uh, could be, or well, basically accounts are filed and then disclosed often about nine months after uh, um, uh, after they are uh, the accounting period finishes. So in that intervening period, material things can take place and they are uh, described in uh, post balance sheet events. Uh, related party transactions. These can be good 
for people looking at corruption uh, because they can show um, potentially individual directors or companies that um, are beneficially owned by uh, a director or shareholder. Um, they, you can see money going to those particular entities. The ultimate controlling party is obviously an important um, uh, note item. And there are other useful information about loans, share-based payments and, and directed advances that sometimes get uh, listed in notes in different headings. Okay, right, revenue recognition. When companies book revenue is a really important uh, issue and can be an accounting nightmare and actually can compromise a company's um, viability. Um, for companies undertaking long-term contracts, this is a, like infrastructure, transport, uh, yeah, building work, uh, mineral and uh, extraction, uh, when a lot of investment has to go in, this can be very, very important. And the, there's a formal policy, uh, which is disclosed in the note, and most people, including myself, rarely read them. However, they can actually retrospectively show weaknesses um, in a company. Companies who take an aggressive revenue stance uh, to book revenue before they receive it in the bank. That's an aggressive revenue stance, and this is risky. It can lead to disaster. Now, I mentioned Carillion at the beginning, this infrastructure company that, that um, uh, went under, um, and there was a link uh, in that um, to a House of Commons report. And in that report, there was this excellent graph. Um, so aggressive accounting means declaring the profit before receiving the money. They actually book money before they receive it. And it can show up if cash from operations deviates from declared profit. So this graph is interesting. So cash from operations is in the, there's a line that's in the cash flow statement. And over time, uh, the researchers using publicly available accounts showed that the cash from operations was going down immensely. In fact, it even went into negative territory. And yet the profit the company was making was going up. Now, how did this happen? This is because of revenue recognition. Um, so, I mean, I learned something over the last few days and that actually, if you look through the cash from operations, you potentially can see uh, a disparity with the profit line. And that can be a clue as to aggressive accounting. So, and you pick that up from, and this is, operating profits uh, before tax. Uh, uh, and this is from the cash flow statement, cash from operations. So just to give you a real graphical picture, what happens when um, uh, 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 aggressive revenue recognition policies are deployed? Um, this is the cash position, which you have seen. And this, um, once, uh, the company's uh, suppliers uh, got wind of the situation, profits started to plunge and people were, were not doing business with the company and the company just went out of business and it was a massive uh, stock market listed company. And you could see the signs and it was down to revenue recognition. And this is the language that is used. Um, it's a different company, uh, but this is the principle holds. So, one thing that we haven't said is that accountants often use judgments. This, it, ju accounting can be an art, not a science. So our revenue recognition policy here is a judgment call. And they, they make that known quite clearly. Where amounts have been earned but not invoiced during the period, the amount included in revenue is the proportion of the anticipated net sales value earned to date. So they are anticipating revenues and they haven't even invoiced it and they're describing this in their revenue recognition policy um, again they talk about performance criteria pay, uh, going to revenue um, uh, where, where revenue is determined by reference to performance criteria which are achieved over a period of time i.e a long-term contract it is only recognized once it is probable that the performance criteria will be met now who's saying it's probable um, the, the company themselves are saying that. So the auditors haven't checked it. This company uh, was an education training company and um, it was booking revenues before it actually made them. Um, and 
that went out of business. And it, again, it was a stock market company. Okay, so that's revenue recognition. Let's talk about uh, wages. So um, it's a massively exciting kind of area. Well, I say exciting. It's um, it's interesting and an important area of reporting. And um, this is Umeme, a Ugandan uh, a, a monopoly electricity distributing company uh, listed in, on the Ugandan Stock Exchange. So it produces annual reports. Um, and so we can see staff costs uh, under the administrative expenses note item. And if we look at staff costs, they say 7A. So then we have to do a little bit of uh, chasing and we can see salaries and wages. And in fact, salaries and wages have gone down. Well, does this mean that the company has laid off staff? This is in millions of Ugandan shillings. Um, and the, the money has gone down. So we, we want to work out an average salary. So to do that, we need to know how many people are employed by this company. And, it, and most, well, all, virtually all listed companies will tell us how many staff are owned. Sometimes you have to hunt for it quite carefully. Um, this was in operating and other statistics. It, it, it ought to be in a personnel or human resources section, but we had the total number of company employees. And curiously, the number of employees have gone up slightly. So actually the average wages of, of the workers at Umeme has gone down. So what, are there labor issues there? Or is there a bit of unrest? Is, what's the morale like? And um, uh, so that, that's quite good. So we now can see that uh, 35 billion Ugandan shillings divided by 389 staff members gives us an average wage of 25 million Ugandan shillings or six, nearly 7,000 US dollars at the time I did that calculation. Okay, so, okay, we've got the average workers. What about the bosses? Now, unfortunately, a meme doesn't produce um, a highest paid director. Uh, uh, item, which is a bit annoying. Um, uh, however, we can still see that um, uh, we can give some indication as to the wealth of, 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 of the bosses. Um, we can see employees, because there is a remuneration section, so we will go straight direct to the remuneration section. So we, could, we will go to employees and executive directors of the company owned 68 million shares. That's four and a half, four point two percent of the shares. Now, if we if we um, times sixty eight million shares by the share price, we will see the value of those shares. We can see directors earned uh, owed, sorry, uh, owned whatever that number is. So that will be quite good as an indication. And actually, we can see that that number has gone up significantly, more than doubled. In the previous year, assuming the company's share price held its value, but we can see company bosses have uh, have award have been awarded uh, a huge amount uh, of new shares. So that's one thing that we can uh, put uh, in our story if we were looking at wages. Um, we could also see that the non-executive directors, who are part-time directors. Uh, give um, uh, could, right. Sorry, my speakers have run out of juice, so I'm, um, I'm now um, uh, talking directly into the computer. Um, so basically, we can see that um, the uh, non-execs have uh, uh, seen a, a significant pay rise. So if we can count the number of non-execs, these are the part-time directors who are, who supervise the executives. Uh, we, and in fact, there's six of them, actually seven uh, non-execs. So if we divide seven into $865,000, which is more than $100,000, we can see that these part-time directors are, are getting a lot of money. Uh, so we get some indication as to the to, to wages. And, and here's more detail about the shares uh, owned by uh, the senior executives at 
Umeme. And here we can see that Patrick uh, Baturate, uh, forgive my pronunciation, uh, Jeff Mbango no doubt will help me there, but um, his sh share awards have gone up hugely, um, about uh, four times the shares he got awarded there. Um, so we've, we've got 20 million shares. If we times that by the market price at 2014, we would get his share, uh, the value of his shares. So that's quite useful as well. Um, pensions, great source of uh, wealth for the senior executives. This is a Scottish bank. Um, so you would probably get the, if there was a mining company operating in your company, um, which was based in uh, America, France, the UK, you would probably get information about uh, their, the boss's pensions as well. Here we can see uh, a Mr. Fish working for um, a Royal Bank of Scotland. His pension went up from $17 million, $18 million nearly, to $24 million. So we can get little snippets of huge wealth. Um, uh, the chief executive, who's a controversial character, his pension went up from $7 million to $8 million. Now, um, in American companies uh, can give you the amount of share options a boss has. Uh, we can see, I looked the other day, that Google's chief executive has share awards of about $280 million. Uh, his shares are worth that much. Um, his, this is our, our, our friend Barclay Group and, and British quoted companies uh, disclose the, the rewards going to senior executives in a very easily understood way. So it's useful. If you're, if you're interested in a company owned by a British stock market company, we can, you can see the awards going to these executives. Here we can see the different components, the salary, the benefits, the annual bonus, but this is the thing, the multi-year uh, share incentives. This is a thing that uh, uh, goes to the heart of the chief executive motivation we were talking about. Here we can see the senior executive at Barker Group has shares worth 26.8 million, uh, an increase of 7 million from the previous year. His total reward went up from 21 and a half million pounds to 29 million pounds. Uh, this is a man who's benefiting personally from the huge amount of money, a lot of it corrupt, coming into London. His deputy saw a near tripling of his salary. Uh, it's all there. So you can use that um, uh, if, if, there were, uh, uh, if it was, say, a mining company um, and there was a problem with uh, labour conditions or what have you, you could go to that, that and do this type of exercise. Um, loans. Um, this is a very good way for uh, corrupt activity to take place. A company lending money. Uh, this um, is uh, or potentially corrupt. Uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a red flag. It might not be corrupt, but um, just for for uh, the balance and fairness here. Uh, so here is a loan given to a Tanzanian pet, which was disclosed in. Uh, Vodacom, the, the uh, South African based mobile phone company that owns mobile phone businesses in Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, South Africa, um, and uh, other Southern Africa, and Kenya now as well. They own the uh, uh, Safaricom. Um, so they, uh, in their accounts, you can see loans receivable. Uh, and here we can see a loan with a value of 14.9 million. With, uh, bearing interest of uh, uh, LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Offer Rate, which is the uh, base rate, um, plus 5%, so a, they put a little bit of a return on there, shall be repaid from any cash distributions from Vodafone Tanzania. So this is basically, um, the repayment is coming from dividends. So the, the, the Marambo is not actually paying back um, uh, this loan, it's coming through up by dividends. Now, this is an interesting scenario. Uh, you know, uh, if, you, if I was to give you money and you didn't have to pay me back until our business was making money, that would be quite a generous deal, I think you might find. So who was Marambo? Well, Marambo was owned by Rostam Aziz, 
uh, who was Tanzania's first billionaire um, and a very politically uh, engaged person. So uh, that became a story basically alongside um, a couple of other examples that uh, of similar uh, practices by Vodacom. So, and this was disclosed in the uh, loans section of Vodacom's accounts. Um, uh, in Mozambique, uh, uh, this very similar deal went to uh, the investment company of Grasha Machel. Um, so it's, it was there. It, um, right, a uh, quick look at tax. Um, Starbucks, the American coffee company, um, basically uh, didn't pay any tax in these two years in Britain. No tax paid. One of the world's biggest coffee companies not paying any tax. It made revenues turnover of 300, nearly 400 million pounds and its cost of sales was a significant amount of money. Um, it made an operating loss. Um, it barely made any money, a gross profit of that, 78, 80 million pounds. Um, big administrative expenses. So it was a loss making company. Now this is a bit perplexing because Starbucks was telling its investors how profitable the UK was. So what's going on? Well, if we look at another of its rivals, Costa Coffee, which is owned by a British company, um, its revenues are slight, are comparable in this, in 2011, and slight, uh, quite higher in the next year, but its cost of sales are much lower. So there we can see a significant red flag. It was making, uh, it was making, ta it paid tax, um, and um, was not loss making. Um, its cost of sales are so low. So how come its cost of sales are so low? And that's the question you should be asking um, Starbucks, I guess. Um, now we can see various reasons for, uh, we can begin to see certain uh, uh, monies if we look at the accounts um, going out of the company. So we can see consistently 25 million pounds going out in royalties and licenses. This is disclosed in, in accounts. Um, in the, this is an, a source company. Um, so if you can get hold of accounts, you can see royalties and license fees, etc. Uh, sometimes being disclosed, but as we know, the challenge is getting hold of those accounts. Um, likewise, Starbucks was paying interest to its group companies, uh, nearly five million uh, in 2010, and then nearly two million. Uh, the next year. So if you begin to chart that over five years, you can begin to see significant amounts of money going out of the company. This is chipping away at the, um, at the tax base of Starbucks and it's disclosable. Um, tax is described at great length in the tax note. And this will um, give you uh, the factors affecting the tax expense and you, so you will see um, this, how much tax this is Vodacom Tanzanish would be paying under the statutory tax rate um, according to the profits that it's made but then there, it will show you the, the way that um, different um, uh, factors chip away at the amount of tax it should, uh, that it might otherwise be paying. Here we can see there was a non-taxable gain on the disposal of an investment in a mobile phone tower company, HTT. So it didn't pay tax on that profit. Now, this could be a red flag for tax avoidance, but actual, actually subsequent investigations um, show that actually there was tax paid on it, but in a different uh, jurisdiction. Um, so it wasn't tax avoidance in this instance, but this describes, but it, it would set your pulses going if you saw that then you'd have to, the next stage would be to prove that it was what you thought it was. Related party transactions, really important. Um, remembering that um, we're sucking, sometimes companies suck money out of its um, different uh, subsidiaries. Here we can see the group made loan repayments of five million pounds from a subsidiary of one of the group's ultimate shareholders, Crown Resorts. This is a casino company. Uh, the total amounts outstanding, da, 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 da. the loans bear interest of between 5 and 16%. Now, 
interest rates of 16% are hyper aggressive and, and that would be uh, that ought to uh, raise an eyebrow of a journalist and of actually of a revenue authority. Um, there are all sorts of other um, related party transactions, money going to a uh, wildlife charity, which actually this was in 2015, uh, I think it was last year, these payments became the subject of a news story. Um, and there's consultancy services provided. So there's all sorts of money that's chipping away uh, going to shareholders of this casino company. Here we can see at the bottom, the ultimate parent and, and controlling party. Here we can see the company's immediate and ultimate parent undertaking was Asper's Holdings in Jersey, uh, which is somewhat annoying because Jersey companies don't tend to produce their um, uh, financial statements. But you, if you were writing a report, you could see owned by an, a company owned in the offshore jurisdiction of Jersey. Or, or, okay. Um, I think it's probably wise to stop there. I mean, you got, I'm not sure if you're regulars with GIGN, you probably know that you can, well, okay, let's quickly look at where we can sort of obtain company accounts. Quoted companies are a brilliant source of information. The Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the Canadian Stock Exchange, lots of mining companies operating all over the world are based uh, on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Uh, South Africa Stock Exchange releases um, uh, regulatory information and if the company is quoted in the South Africa Stock Exchange it will have an investor relations section and they will provide the annual reports that you want to look at. Hong Kong companies, UK stock market companies, uh, UK companies house. Uh, if you go, you guys know about the investigative dashboard so you can get links to all of these offshore jurisdictions. Um, no doubt you'll be, you, you, if you wanted to, the, the, the GRJN has information about how to get uh, documents out of some of these jurisdictions. And we also have information about that too. Um, um, so investigative dashboard, open corporates, the offshore leaks, open oil, all of these resources can give you financial information. Um, I like to keep all of my financial information in a little tab that I have um, with uh, all the finance, so it's all nicely together. Um, and I'm sorry that I raced to the end. I, um, I hope this has been useful. Use our trend tracker, which uh, you will be using um, uh, to do the exercise for next week. If you are, if you want to, um, it's a, it's a come come to our, our session next week um, where you will be doing a bit of work and we'll be on hand to help. Um, so let's see if we can track Guinness Nigeria together. Um, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Nick, uh, for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, we've had a, yeah, about two hours uh, of, of the session and I think yeah, everybody has uh, you know, it, it's been quite comprehensive. Now, if um, anyone had any questions, I think you we can prepare them for the next session. I have shared a link uh, for the interactive session on Wednesday, June 23rd. You can register there and uh, we should be able to link up again next week. Um, for now, I think we'll uh, end it here. I would just like to thank uh, the different people who have made sure that this has happened and everything has gone smoothly. Our two online producers, Leonardo Peralta and Andrea Romanos, who have done a great job uh, uh, behind the scenes. Um, let me also thank uh, Nick Mathiason and Ted Jury from Finance Uncovered, who have, uh, you know, Nick has made the presentation, Ted has been behind the scenes responding to all the questions that you've asked in the Q&A box. Uh, thank you, Ted. And uh, finally, I would like to thank the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, who have also been our partners in uh, making sure uh, this webinar comes to you. Finally, um, I would like to share that the recording for this webinar, if you didn't, weren't able to take in everything that uh, Nick has shared, 
um, we will be sharing a recording uh, such, um, such that you can still continue reviewing uh, whatever he presented. And um, alongside the recording, there will be lots of other resources uh, that will be shared with you. Uh, so please uh, watch out for that as you prepare for the next session. So thank you so much. And uh, at this point, I'll say goodbye to everybody and see you on Wednesday, June 23rd. Uh, till then, bye-bye.